day by day, moment by moment. All righty, well, let's jump into the Word this morning. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3 this morning, and uh, we're going to look at a little bit of a different kind of message, but based here in Genesis, uh, of course, we'll be looking at chapter 12 in a little bit, but we'll start here in, uh, in chapter 3. As we've been studying Abram and, uh, and God's call on his life, uh, it's just amazing to see how this all comes together uh, in, uh, in what I might call a, a missions program. And this is really what we're seeing here in Genesis is the beginning of a missions program. I'm glad that here in our church we have a missions program, that we have a, a focus on reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but it wasn't an idea that we came up with. It wasn't an idea that, uh, that uh, just uh, originated even with the Great Commission uh, as Jesus commissioned his disciples. It, it, it didn't even originate there. The missions program originated in Genesis chapter 3. And it goes all the way back to the beginning. And so what we, what we pour ourselves into and what we call a missions program here at this church is really just fulfilling the heart of God since He created the world. And so I want you to see that this morning as we look at Genesis and many other passages uh, and, and we'll consider these truths. And so you're there in Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to... Uh, begin just reading verses 14 and 15. After that, we'll pray and look at uh, these and other verses as well. Genesis 3 and verse number 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And... I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Lord, I pray that as we look at this verse and, and other verses, that, Lord, you would have your way in our hearts and lives, that we would understand truly the verses before us, and that as we see a big picture from the scriptures this morning that our burden and our vision would be expanded and widened for the entire globe. And that, Lord, we would see that our purpose on this earth is so much bigger than our happiness in our little corner of this world but that you have called us to great things for a great purpose because you're a great God. So help us now in these moments as we look at these verses. May we be in awe of you and may we embrace the calling that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, this is right on the heels of the the, the first sin ever committed, you will recall that God created the heavens and the earth, that God made this world, that God created human beings, and that God placed Adam and Eve, our parents, in the garden in a perfect environment, and God gave them one requirement, one law, one rule that they were to obey, and that was that they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so they lived in that garden. We don't know how long, but before long, the devil himself came and tempted Eve and uh, showed her the attractions of sin. And she was drawn away. She, and the Bible says her husband with her, both Adam and Eve fell into sin and committed that sin, took the fruit, rebelled against God, decided that God's plan wasn't good enough, that their plan was better, and so they, they entered into a rebellion against God. 
And having done so, they plunged the entire human race, you and I included, into this rebellion against God. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, we know that deep down inside, we really want to do what we really want to do. Uh, we'd rather not take any instructions from God. We'd rather just kind of do our own thing. And that's a very natural way for us to live because we were born in sin, because of Adam and Eve. And so the whole human race was plunged into sin at this moment. And perhaps it would seem that because of that foolish decision on the part of those two first human beings, that all hope was lost, that everything was going to be ruined, that all of creation would be turned upside down, that there would be no hope because of this sin. Oh, but God had a plan. God had a plan. And his plan, he, he knew what Adam and Eve would do. He knew what would happen. But because of his love for them and for you and I, even on the heels of this horrible sin, God gives hope. And here's what he says in verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. There's going to be a battle, he says. It's going to be between you, Satan, and the woman, and, uh, and then it says, between thy seed and her seed. This is a human issue, a human problem. And, and then he says, it shall bruise thy head. That is, the seed of the woman will bruise your head, uh, bringing death, bringing finality, bringing destruction to the devil, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It would also cause pain and suffering for this deliverer, this promised seed that would come. Uh, but this was the message of hope. See, all hope was not lost. Even though Adam and Eve plunged all of us into sin, God's plan was to bring about redemption. And I want you to see in this passage and some others, and, and I hope that you got the notes, you'll be looking at that on Wednesday uh, and, and digging into several of these verses. But uh, what I want you to see is that God's vision and plan was for a, a, a global redemption. When I say that, I, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to use the word universal because although it may not be a wrong way to use it, but, but in many senses people think of universal salvation, and that's not what the Bible teaches, the, the thought that all people will be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. But here in this passage, we see that since Adam and Eve were the first of all humans, God gives a promise to their seed, to the seed of the, the woman here, that there would be redemption, and in that sense made available to all. There are a couple of thoughts that I want to pull out here of this verse that I found in, uh, in a uh, book that I have on my shelf, uh, the, A Biblical Theology of Missions, a great book. And uh, George Peters points out several facts here from this verse. And I want you to think about this and, and how this lays the foundation for the, for the, uh, the missions program of any church and uh, that God would establish uh, in the world. First of all, uh, we see this point that salvation is wrought by God. It's brought about by God Himself. God brings about salvation. God initiates salvation. God originates salvation. God secures salvation. It is by His grace that anyone is saved. And He starts it all and He finishes it all. And, and it is in this verse that we see that God has promised it. He says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to send this promised seed. There's going to be redemption. And it's at His initiative. He makes it happen. And praise God for that. Because if it was up to Adam and Eve, we'd have never had salvation. If it was up to you and me, we would never have the possibility of salvation. And so here in this verse, we see that salvation is wrought by God Himself. He originates, initiates, and secures it completely by His grace. Secondly, we see that salvation will destroy Satan, not just neutralize him. 
And I think that's very important today because there's a thought today and, and, and especially with, with Eastern kind of religions and, 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 and Hollywood movies and everything that there's, there's, there's somehow uh, peace in a balance between evil and good and some balance between light and dark and some balance between good and wrong. No, my friends... The peace comes when, when evil is eradicated. And by God's grace and His plan of salvation, the devil will be. Amen to that. You see, salvation is brought about by God and it ends in the destruction of evil and the devil himself. Thirdly, we see that salvation is for mankind as a whole and not just a select few. You know, we, we might have a tendency to consider, well, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just the God of the Jews. And, and this is their religion. And this is for them. And perhaps the, the, the masses of the world, the tribes, the families of the world today would have the same idea. Oh, that's a white man's religion. But our religion is. But no. God offers this salvation, this promise of salvation to all of the descendants of Adam and Eve. This is global in its impact. It's not just for a select few. Not just a small group that salvation is for. But God offers it in His grace to all. And that is the very reason why we take the gospel message into all the world and preach the gospel to just a few? No, friends. Preach the gospel to every creature. Every created being. Because God's message of salvation is available for mankind as a whole, not just a select few. We also see in this verse, in, uh, in this passage, that salvation will come through a mediator, a, a savior, a human savior, the seed of the woman. God's plan of redemption, God's plan of salvation uh, is, is wrought about by a a person, a human being, and Jesus is the only one that could fit the bill here because He is both God and man, 100% man, 100% God, without any sin. And so Jesus Himself fits to perfection this prophecy because salvation will come through the seed of the woman, a human Savior, a human mediator, even though it must be divine. We also see, number five, that salvation comes through the suffering of the Redeemer. While the, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, also that seed will be, his heel will be hurt, uh, crushed in that sense. And so, and of course, this refers to Jesus Christ as He hung on the cross of Calvary and, and suffered for your sins and for my sins and indeed for the sins of the whole world, as the Bible teaches. And so, this salvation must come through suffering, the suffering of the Redeemer. Now, one other point that uh, Peters points out in his book is that salvation, as we see in this passage, is as historical and real as the fall into sin itself. Adam and Eve, by that historic act, plunged all of humanity into sin. And just as historic, though it hasn't happened yet, will be the redemption of creation. When Jesus sits on the throne... And all is made right. That is, this, that is just as real and just as historic as the fall into sin itself. Praise God for these things. See, this is this, this beginning of the missions program all summed up in this one promise, this one verse uh, that, that comes as a response to sin itself. And so we, we see the promise. We see the promise. But also I want you to see that the beginning of this missions program also comes about because of a universal need. A universal need. There is a great need. Turn ahead to, to Genesis 9. 
Genesis chapter 9. You will recall that the human race had plunged into rebellion against God. It it was to such an extent that God told Noah in chapter 6 that that he was sorry about the whole thing. Uh, And that he desired to, to wipe it clean. And that's exactly what he did with the flood, the global flood. Because the the problem was universal or global. Uh, He he wipes clean the globe, sending the flood. Everyone dies except for those that were on the ark. And only eight human beings survive. And as these eight human beings come off the ark... God renews a a promise and a vision. He reveals Himself to all the human beings that were on the earth at at the time. Now think about that. He reveals Himself to all the human beings that were alive on the earth. A, a, A universal revelation of Himself. That's incredible. And so here in chapter 9, verse number 8, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him. Uh, Whatever God is about to promise and say here and reveal is good for not only Noah, but his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All of them could claim this promise, and in, in that is all of you and I. It's not just for Jews here, which would be Uh, those that would come from Shem, but it's also for those that come from Ham and also those that come from Japheth. All of them get in on this. He says, "I Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. That includes you and me. And with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle, uh, of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between you, I'm sorry, between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. That includes you and me. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall... Uh, Come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it and I remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. That's a universal promise, a universal covenant that God would not destroy all again by water. And, And so this promise is universal in its reach in that sense. Because God's heart is not just for Noah. And God's heart is not just for Shem, but God's heart is for all. That's important for us to understand and grasp a hold of. And so the, the need is universal, and God reaches and promises for all. This promise is made available to all. I think in Romans chapter 1, uh, we see perhaps a, uh, an explanation of what happens in this time after Noah comes off of the, off the boat and uh, the generations uh, begin to rebel once again against God. And it gets pretty bad again. And, uh, and we know that in Genesis chapter 11, uh, there is the, the historical account of the Tower of Babel. And at this point in history, everyone was speaking the same language. It was one family in the earth. And God had made this promise to Noah and his family, which was the only family, the human family. 
And so this, this promise of, of blessing and protection uh, from the judgment of God to come uh, was extended to all the family of the earth. There was only one at the time. Well, in Romans chapter 1, we kind of see what happens in this generation. It seems that they, they plunge themselves into rebellion against God, and God actually gives them up. Look at verse number 15. So as much as in me, I am ready, the Apostle Paul says, to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, I'm thankful that the righteousness of God is revealed through Jesus Christ and by Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's available universally. Uh, that's the gospel message. Well, why is this so crucial? Why is it so important that we have a revelation of the, of the righteousness of God? Because of what happens in the next couple of verses. We, we need the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith because, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. God has already revealed His wrath. And He will yet reveal His wrath even more so. Uh, to the world. The, the coming judgment. How does God reveal His wrath? Well, we, we kind of trace it down here. Why does He reveal it? First of all, because the people that, that knew something of God rejected what they knew of God. Verse number 19. Because that, they which, uh, that which may be known of God is manifest or displayed in them for God hath showed it unto them. Praise God that He reveals Himself to everyone. That's what it says there. What do they do with it? In this case, they reject it. And think of the people that came off of the, the ark. And that promise of God's blessing and protection was given to all of them. But what do they do with what has been revealed to them of God and His promises? They reject it. They turn away from it. They could have known it. It was displayed for them in the creation. It was displayed for them in the flood. It was displayed for them in the specific revelation given them uh, through Noah himself and, and at that time. But yet they reject it. In verse 20, the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of God, of the incorruptible God, into an image made like uncorruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They had a revelation of God. They, they could have known Him and they rejected Him. How sad. They rejected Him and so God gives them up. And I think that perhaps, and I see my time flying so quickly, I, see, I think that perhaps by God's divine judgment on them at the Tower of Babel, God gives them up. He confuses their language. It says, you want to sin, then you can live in sin. And at that point, He confuses their language, which to some extent... Uh, restricts that sin because they can't coordinate it as much anymore. And so suddenly now we have the nations, the families of the earth are born in a day when God confuses their language. But God does not give them up forever from there. In that context, God brings about the gospel message through a man called Abram. And God calls Abram, one of those families, calls him out of the rest of the families of the earth. And then through Abram, God provides a promise of blessing that would reach all the families of the earth. Because that was God's original and, and His desire since the creation. To bless all the families of the earth. And so now... 
God institutes a missions program right here. He calls a specific family and then commissions this specific family to be a blessing to the other families of the earth. And specifically the blessing through faith. I don't have time to uh, go into all of that and develop it. I, I hope that you take these notes and dig in and study them out. But God initiates this missions program and promises both to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that through their, their descendants, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And then God renews that through Moses as Moses begins and, and establishes the nation of Israel. And God uh, tells Moses to tell the people that they are a peculiar people to him, a special people, a kingdom of priests, indicating that they would be mediators of a blessing for the whole world. And in fact, the Apostle Peter renews that same commission to you and I who are in the church today. So the big picture is that God called out uh, Abram and his descendants as Jews to be that missionary influence in the world. And then when Jesus himself came, he came to his own first. You can read it in John chapter 1. He came to his own first, his own being the Jewish people. But what did they do? They rejected Him. They rejected Him. But God would not be left without a witness in the world. And so from that point, God begins something new, a new creation in that sense. It is the church. And God now commissions the church to take this blessed gospel of Jesus Christ and give it to all the world. It is universal in its call. And so we extend it to all the world because as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, and sadly, I have to close here. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, we see this, uh, this extension of this incredible position as a, as a mediator. Uh, let me see if I can find 1 Peter. It's right before 2 Peter. I know that. <laughs> and so in the 1 Peter chapter, what did I say, 2, in verse, let me look at verse 3. If so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. How many of you would say, I've tasted that God is gracious. I'm saved, praise God. All right. Okay, you've tasted this. Now, if you've tasted this, what applies here, the, the rest of this passage applies to you. The Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, ye also, as lively stones, are built up to a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Skip down to uh, verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should Show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that... Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Don't you see that God initiated this missions program, clear back in Genesis, that God established a missions program when he called Abram out? And then God renews that missions program as He develops and, and creates a new peculiar people, that's you and I, as the church of Jesus Christ. We are that peculiar people. We are now commissioned by God to take the light of the gospel and spread it to the world. 
It's not enough, friends, for us to sit by and be thankful and say, well, praise God, I'm saved. That's good. It's not enough for us to sit around and say, hey, you know, we got a sign out front. If people want it, they'll come for it. No, friends. God initiated this missions program. And if we are to follow with His heartbeat, then we too will take the gospel message to the world. Not waiting for them to ask. Not hoping that they would ask. But knowing they won't. And so we will take it to them. That's the missions program. And it's available to all. I wonder, are you involved? Are you a part of it? Uh, have, you, have you taken that missions program and said, you know what, I need to get in on this. Maybe God's called you to be a missionary. Maybe God's called you to take the gospel to a friend, to a neighbor, to a family member. Maybe God's called you to take some gospel tracts with you, get them in your pocket, get them in your hand so you can give them to other people. Maybe God's called you to invite somebody to come and hear the preaching of the word. Maybe God's called you to, to invite somebody to go to the small group meeting so that they can learn more about Jesus Christ and the gospel message. Maybe God's called you to take this gospel message and submit your whole life to it and train in a Bible school and learn all you can, learn another culture, learn another language, and go and take the gospel message to the world. Maybe God's called you to do that. I don't know. But He has called you to be involved in a missions program. There is some way that you must be, you can be involved in what God is doing. And my prayer is that you'll submit to it. And that you'll no longer have this attitude that I'm saved and I'm glad and that's wonderful, and people can do what they want, live and let live, and all that nonsense. Forget it. Forget it. There's a world lost and dying and going to hell. And we've been given the commission to take the message to them, the gospel light. Will you do it? Will you do it? Well, let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would put in us a burden, a heart, a passion, To, to be missionaries. May we not be just complacent with what you've done in our lives, but may we take this blessed gospel and share it with a world that so desperately needs it. Lord, we need to embrace this call and we need your empowerment to follow through. And so, God, I pray that you would work and move in our hearts and build in us, create in us the faith to believe, to go, to give, and to pray that the world would receive the gospel. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.